Hello, this is Bruce, and welcome to my tutorial on the Coronado Cessna 208 Bravo EX Grand Caravan. This is a tutorial mostly for myself because I tend to uh, forget some of the nuances and details and things I've learned in the past, so I'm documenting them. I'm hoping to do this in about 25 minutes. It'll take us up to the point where we're ready to taxi and uh, take off. So, I hope you enjoy this too, and uh, any feedback is welcome because we certainly learn from each other. We're here in the outside view, obviously, and if you press Shift 4, you can see that the options here are all available to you. Uh, the pilot's door will open with a click, and the co-pilot's door as well, as we'll just kind of roll around here. There's the co-pilot's, and then the passenger door is on the right side in the rear, and that too is easily opened, and then the baggage door will be last as we roll around from the rear of the aircraft, and you'll also see three hatches here for the cargo pod. Now, if you hit the static elements button like so, you'll notice that there aren't any. And that's because two conditions have to be met. It's not Coronado's mistake or something done wrong with your download. What happens is you have to have everything off, which I know ahead of time everything is off interiorly. And then also you need to have your parking brake set, or these will not show up, even though the blue box is highlighted as if they should be. So we'll take that off and we're going to hit control period just for simplicity's sake. Now, when we press static elements, presto, all the things that we expected to be there are. So those two conditions must be met. Everything off, parking brake on. Now we'll take out the static elements. We'll close up our doors. I click through them a little slowly because otherwise they tend to not keep up. And I have to re-click them. There we go. The cargo pod is down here below. It's this big belly, and it'll reduce your airspeed by about eight knots. Uh, we can get rid of it if we choose to. And then we can also then, this other little belly that's left is your liquid ice protection tank, and you can click that and get rid of it if you want to. I'm going to go ahead and leave it as it is. So Shift 4 then gets rid of that window, and we're going to go ahead and pop inside. This is a cold and dark condition, and before we go any further, I just wanted to mention that I'm using P3D version 4.2 chase plane which is going to give us our views active sky which is giving us some rain and some thunder and lightning outside ultimate traffic live at 100 percent general and commercial and p3d's traffic is also at 100 percent um, commercial and general and uh, so we'll see a lot of aircraft out there that's the way i like it and i'm using windows 10 i5 is overclocked ssd drive and nvidia gtx 1070 for those that are curious so here we are in the interior, and all of our static elements are off outside. The parking brake here has been set with the shift or the control period, but if you were to look for it, it's down here. This here is left click, parking brake is off, left click, parking brake is on. Normally, when you have the yoke on there, you can't see it. So I click the yoke away by clicking on this panel. The same thing works over here on the co pilot side. You can bring it back by clicking on that back panel again where it's attached. Um, I just prefer to leave it off so, because I can't wiggle around and look around behind it. So just to get it out of the way is a big help. So the parking brake now is out and it's set. The inertial separator handle here with the long shaft on that black handle, that's the one that's going to redirect the airflow within your engine so that you don't suck up the debris that might be around you, including ice, even when in flight if there's icing conditions because it creates, in my mind, two 90-degree airflow bends mechanically. The air will naturally want to sweep through those bends, but heavier objects won't. And so they'll be exhausted out with the bit of air that doesn't go through the engines, and that protects the blades that are inside from damage. So you want that on in startup, taxi, any time in the air where there's an icing condition possible, because even ice itself can damage your engine and then uh, upon approach to final and on taxi at the destination airport. Fuel tank selector valves now are going to be overhead. These are often overlooked and forgotten without a flow, cheat, a flow chart. Uh, left click each one. We'll turn them on. Otherwise you won't have any fuel for your engine and you'll wonder why it just keeps turning over and nothing's happening. Currently all of our other switches are off. Our trim wheel is right here. We want to trim that needle to the point on that triangle where TO is, take off, and so we'll just roll it with our mouse wheel downwards until it lines up with the tip, or there nearly so. The shutoff for the fuel is here. We want it all the way in, otherwise there will be no fuel flowing to the engine. Left click moves it out and in. 
So we'll leave it fully in to get our engine started. Otherwise, again, it'll just spin and do nothing and never catch. The ignition switch here is on norm, that green tip knob. The power lever is the big black topped one and right here, and that should be right at idle. The blue handle next to it is your prop lever, and that needs to be all the way up to the max. And then just past that, and you can't see it in this chase plane view that I've set up, is behind the power lever, and it's that red one right there, and that's the condition lever, and it needs to be left at off. So we'll go ahead and put the power lever back down to nearly idle, and then there's that hiding right there. That can be really handy. If you're curious about the power emergency power lever, this red one, it will move with a left click back and forth. You don't need it. There's no practical reason for it, although it's immersive. If your pneumatic system failed for your flu fuel flow, then if you click this up, that mechanically keeps the fuel flowing. That's just for that condition, since that's not going to happen. Um, there it is, but you'll never need it. So those are the starting up pieces that need to be preset. Now, battery is on, this red top switch there. The beacon we can turn on. The beacon, there's two rows of six switches here. The bottom right switch of the second row will turn on our beacon, that red flashing light at the top of our tail outside. Avionics 1 and 2 are here. We're going to turn on Avionics 1, which lights up our PFD. Our fuel boost switch now needs to be on. That's two left clicks on the green tip uh, switch below the battery. The ignition switch now needs to be on and that will be here from norm to on. And then the starter switch is this white one. When we turn that to start with a left click, things are going to happen rapidly. What we're going to watch for are these numbers right here where it's 0, 0.0 ng. 0, 0.0. Those are going to rapidly climb to 11, slow a little bit, approaching 12. That's when we're going to want to uh, push our condition lever up to low idle. And then this is really going to race very, very fast upwards in numbers. And when it hits 52, then what we we'll want to do is turn off our start. So watch what happens. Right here. When it gets to 11, it's going to slow a little bit. It's already slowing. Anywhere after 11, approaching 12, we're going to put that up there. When it hits 52, we'll right-click our start right there. And the rest will happen, and it'll settle in. And it's a happy start. Now we can turn off our fuel boost switch with two right clicks. That's now reduced. We're going to turn on our Avionics 2, which turns on our MFD, our multifunction flight display. We can now turn on our nav lights and since we're here, um, I'm going to go ahead and just turn on the strobe and the taxi recognition lights. If you want to turn on the landing lights later on, it's a left click, and these both work uh, synonymously. Let's have a look at our primary flight display. If you click on this top bar, it'll disappear back or expand out. If you want to drag it around, grab the bottom. If you want to shrink it down in size, you can, in case it's just overwhelming and, and you don't want to see that big of a megalith right in front of everything on a pop-up, shrink it down to a more manageable size. But for the sake of this uh, video, I think it might be nice if it was extra large, because I know how hard it is to see sometimes. And so move it around by grabbing the bottom of it. Just to look through this very quickly in case I've forgotten what I'm doing or you're not familiar with it, the NAV1, NAV2 working boxes are on the left side. The uh, entered boxes that are functioning are over here. So to choose between the two, you just left click the nav button and you can see the box jumps now to nav 2, back up to nav 1 with a left click on that. If you want to change the numbers, then if you put your mouse at the top and roll your mouse wheel, all the numbers to the left of the decimal move, and I'm going to just run it up to 111. And then if you want the numbers to the right of the decimal to move, you've got to go to the bottom of the knob and then roll your mouse wheel, and I'm going to leave it at 11.8 because I know that's the frequency for CTW, my first VOR that's listed there. I'm going to click the exchange or tr transfer button to switch from here to here. It recognizes now that frequency as CTW, which it should. Same thing for NAV2 if I wanted to, just left click, enter the number, switch it over, etc. Here's where I'm at now, the uh, waypoint or the airport that I'm currently at. This would be my next waypoint, um, or in case it's a VOR. Here's the distance in statute miles. The bearing 085 degrees to that, 
and then over here rolling across the top is COM1. Same thing, if you left click the COM button you can switch between the working portions over here. These are the ones that have been entered. If I wanted to say for instance enter 122.800 this is how it's done. It's a little different than the nav button. I don't know why, but if you put your mouse at the very top of your com button and you roll your mouse wheel, all the numbers to the left of the decimal will move. If you move your mouse down just a little bit further, and it's kind of a guessing by golly at this point, then the numbers to the right of the decimal will move. And the reason that that's different is, remember, on the nav knob, we put our mouse at the bottom of the knob to move the numbers to the right of the decimal. Over here, that doesn't happen. It's only slightly lower than the top. Down here, if you moved your mouse wheel, nothing happens. Again, you can exchange your COM frequencies over here. And now this is the active uh, COM one, and as this is the active NAV one. I think I'm going to go ahead and change it back so we don't get all that chatter. Here's your torque. This is what your power lever is going to control. Your temps. Here's your uh, NG limits, they keep it in the green there. Here's your prop RPM. This is where your prop lever, the blue handled one, is going to have a big say over this. And there are some numbers involved that you want to aim for. So we'll talk about those a little bit later. Uh, this is basically six of your round gauges in like a Cessna, all combined into a glass format, by the way. So if you have those six in mind, you might be become more comfortable with the way this is laid out. This is your speed strip over here on the left. Your uh, knots are listed here. If it's in the red as it is now, you don't want to be in the air in the red. That's a warning. And then it turns yellow as it goes higher up the scale and then green. There's a white vertical strip as well, usually associated with the green. Um, and it is your flap operating speeds. These letters here actually are really helpful. They'll show up on the speed strips coinciding with these uh, speeds here. So say for instance this mark here reaches 73, the R will also be just right over here next to it. The R is your rotation speed, very handy. The X is your best rate of climb. You want to climb over a tree or some other object, power line. That's your speed 86. If your engine quits in flight and you want to glide the farthest distance, it's 90. And then Y is the best rate of climb at 108. So those are there listed for you. This heading indicator here is what your heading gauge or your heading knob is turned to. So as you can see, it turns with my mouse wheel. It moves in very fine, slow movements. If you right click it, however, it jumps in groups of 10 degrees at a time. So that's super handy if you have to turn it like 180 degrees or something. And then if you right click it again, it goes back to a finer motion. The 282 is the direction of the nose of the aircraft at the present. This is the course to my nearest way or the next waypoint, which in this case is a VOR. This is my true airspeed. It will not match the indicated airspeed because this is computer generated from an onboard computer in the aircraft. It'll just give you that number in, as compared to the indicated airspeed. Here's the outside air temperature, 24 degrees Celsius. If that is five or less, then you'll probably want to consider uh, putting on your heat, which is here. The pitot um, static tubes will be heated. The stall heat can be turned on. A light can be turned on on the wings. So you can see if there's any rime, ice, or other things accumulating. The prop heat can be moved up here to auto. And that's, I usually keep this on auto and the pitot heat on to make sure my pitot tubes don't ice up and then I don't know what my indicated airspeed is. So those are handy. Let's see what else do we have here on this. This is your artificial horizon, um, and then your bank angle, and your rate of climb, like 10 degrees, is usually what you shoot for on takeoff. And your flight director here gives you that nice magenta marking there. So that's a big help. Over here, you've got your altitude that you've selected in your alt cell. So rolling my mouse upwards, you can see it's going to jump by thousands. If I right click that alt cell knob, now it's going to run in the hundreds. So I'm going to get to 13,000. So I'm going to right click it again and it'll quickly run up to 13. Right now it says the barometer is 2992. You can change that by your mouse wheel, like so, and it'll obviously run up just using your mouse wheel, go past all the numbers. There's no right or left of the decimal shortcuts. Um, but it's easier just to hit B 
on your keyboard and it jumps to the current barometric pressure, altitude, vertical speed, up or down. That's your target altitude. If you're using the flight level change or the vertical speed to climb, it will level off at that altitude. If you press the Alt button up here, then that will level off at the altitude you pressed it. So it's not necessary to push the Alt, it'll level off here and that's very handy. If you're looking for a glide slope and you've entered your figures for an ILS, it will show up right next to this. And if there is no glide slope that it's picking up, it'll say no GS and it'll really get your attention. Also, interestingly, um, over here on the speed strip, you'll notice that as you accelerate or decelerate, there's a little strip that shows up. I think it's a pink color and it'll rise or descend basing, basically depending upon if you're accelerating or decelerating. And what it is telling you is that in nothing else, if nothing else changes in seven seconds, that's the speed that you'll be at. So it's a little forecaster for you, as well as a handy visual for um, whether you're accelerating or decelerating. The transponder figure is here. It's a 1200, which is a VFR. It's on standby. If you want to change this to a SWAC, SWAC code, hit the XPDR transponder and then hit code. And then these soft keys below the numbers, if you press methodically, four of them, there you go, and I got 6543 for example. It's on standby. That jumps right to that when you're finished with your fourth number. If you want to turn it on, you got to go back to the XPDR and then go here to on. If you want it on alt, hit alt. I believe that if it's on as you take off when you're airborne, it'll automatically switch to alt, but keep an eye on that. If you want VFR, there you go, 1200. Again, if you want to ident, that's probably not the way you're going to want to do it, but that option's available. Hit back if you want to get back to the main screen. Nearest here, all the little favorites that are nearby. Uh, time references, you can fiddle with those options. I usually leave them alone. Uh, the CDI here changes from the GPS to VOR1. Notice the VOR1 now is in green up here. It's recognizing that this and this are the frequencies that are connected. And then if you hit it again, there's VOR2. And here's another one, this VOR2 is lit in green. So you know you're on VOR2 down here by the appearance of the color up here. And obviously there is no uh, VOR with 110.6, so there's nothing listed. It's just saying, hey, we're in sync here, VOR2 there. So I'm going to leave it on the GPS for now. Over here, the PFD, the wind features three options. One tells us the um, crosswind and whether we got, you know, how much is coming from the front. I don't like that option. I prefer the hybrid, which tells me that it's coming off my nose, slightly to my right at four knots. Option three just gives you some more information. I prefer um, option two for simplicity of information, and it gives me pretty much everything I ever needed. Hit back, and now we can do bearing one and bearing two. Bearing one's gonna show up on the left side. Bearing two is gonna show up on the right side. Nav one, nav two. If you press this again, it jumps to the GPS. If you press this again on the bearing two, it also goes to GPS. Press the bearing one again, it goes to automatic direction finder. The same thing occurs over here. Just to uh, illustrate now, I'm gonna leave this on GPS to explain something that uh, may not seem obvious at first. I didn't catch it, but I think I've got it now. The nautical miles here and the statute miles up here give us two distances. Otherwise, you may wonder why the distance to CTW is different. And I think that that's the primary reason right there. Um, this also, by the way, tells me my destination, Pittsburgh. So, and then now we can go and get a DME in there as well. It shows up over here, NAV1. You can have it or not, it's up to you. I do leave it on. Obviously, it's uh, not showing the nautical miles yet, but it will when we get up there, it engages and uh, connects. I think that's good enough for most of the majority of the information. These do work, I just don't like them. They're too hard to use. I mean, I don't have the toggle thing going on that the actual plane has. Um, this is the direct to menu flight plan procedure like an ILS or something like that that you wanna select, enter and clear. Uh, this ring has an outer darker uh, circle and then the inner lighter gray circle. Those do actually have two different functions. You can use your mouse wheel to explore that. Um, the outer one, I believe, will um, give you the letter sequence, like do you want the first letter, the second letter, the third letter to change, and then the inner wheel will change the one that you picked with the outer circle or vice versa. I don't like to use it, especially if you're 
bouncing around in the air and it's such a fine tuned uh, situation that I just prefer to even go up here to the nav and change my flight planner and call it good as awkward as that is um, I'd rather do that than fiddle with all of this so just uh, a warning for those that are courageous feel free now we're going to move over to the MFD the multi flap display again top bar just makes it vanish top bar brings it out drag it by the bottom I'm gonna go ahead and enlarge it just for the video so we can easily see what's going on here this first says press enter or rightmost soft key to continue well I'm just gonna hit the rightmost soft key there we are here's all these different aircraft in the air these diamond shapes there the pointer here on a, another scope looks like it should be behind it like an ATC scope these are all in front of the aircraft. The longer that they are, the faster the aircraft is flying. And then you can see the direction they're going by where they're pointed with that little nose sticking out there. I haven't seen any way to bring up uh, the descriptions like altitudes and the aircraft ID and that kind of stuff in this one. So declutter first, let's look at that. Declutter one, declutter two, declutter three. That is a real declutter. We're going to go ahead and just leave it on the normal one. You can change your range by putting your mouse up here on the range, and you can dial out quite a long ways or clear into one nautical mile if you want to. That's close. But we'll go back out to about 10. I think that's uh, pretty fair and gives us enough information. These should all look like the PFD, right? And these are all interconnected. So what you do on this side is done on the other. Um, so they're interconnected that way. These are the same as the other one. I just prefer not to use them. If down here you click to the right, watch this. It says map, navigation map. If you put your mouse on this wheel and you wheel your mouse wheel to the right, you get the traffic map up to 12 nautical miles, 612. Roll it again, and now you've got terrain proximity. I'm in a very flat part of the country, so it's all monochromatic at the moment. Um, and then the next one would be weather and notice these four options are there we're in the furthest to the right the fourth one and up here you can see it's map weather that says map we're going to roll now the left map terrain proximity traffic and back to where we started the nav map and that's of course our line of travel there you can also get some changes here by clicking map now you got topo and you do see some variables here and the colorations just minor terrain is going to be that monochromatic red again if I was in a mountainous area we would see different colors airways they do work the gray would be your low and the green would be your high and you this is all of them combined they are not labeled by their airways they're just lines of color um, so we can go low or we can go high or we can just turn them all off not super useful unless you just want to eyeball the fact that yeah you're on the uh, the airway that you wanted to be on Traffic, on or off, simple as that. Hit the back key to go back to your standard options. And that's pretty much everything right there. Estimated time, uh, tracking, direct to would be the 085 degrees, ground speed would be over here. So those are just some little handy features that you can keep track of. Now we're gonna go ahead and turn on our um, standby alt alternator power switch is on. So that little yellow orangey light will turn on. The generator switch now is going to be turned on. Two left clicks. Notice all the enunciator warning and pay attention to me kind of a signals gone now. We finally caught up with everything. Heading is set. I'll just left click heading just to jump to the nose. Uh, we'll start with that position. The nav source is set. Um, the blue arrow here, oh, let me expand it. The blue arrow is where the GPS, the traffic that are not the traffic but the line of travel that I've selected in my flight planner there's that and the GPS is in sync with that so that's good the altitude then is set earlier with the uh, alt cell the comm frequency is set or would be set if I'm with the ATC I would simply change it the automatic direction finder as you know is down here this has not got an intuitive piece in it um, the outer wheel will change the numbers in the hundreds just by moving your mouse wheel the inner wheel or the knob will turn the ones then you may ask where's the tens left click on the outer uh, knob wheel and lo and behold the tens work 
left click it again and now we're back up to the hundreds that's not intuitive and it's nice to keep those things in mind at this point I like to turn on my yaw damper right here I like to turn on my flight director which it already is my transponder can be on my flaps will be 20 there are only two settings here and here and you can see this one says 150 this one says 125 for landing uh, to approach etc take off approach so one click on my joystick will bring me down to 20 and that's what I want to have for takeoff my strobes are already on my condition lever now I'm going to move up to high idle and there we go we'll see some changes up here that's to be expected then we'll be ready for taxi um, we're going to take off with our power lever as far up as it'll go without crossing into the red zone here it'll flash at you and flash red if you exceed it on your torque then we're going to also be taken off with flaps 20 between rotating between 65 and 75 in this case as you noticed it was going to be 73 on our Garmin right there the R when we see that R that's a great time to rotate then we're going to climb with flaps at 20 degrees up to 95 knots and then at 95 knots our flaps can go up we're going to climb then between 110 to 120 knots the rate of climb will be somewhere around 900 to 1000 you can you can select your vertical speed to set that up if you want to or if you want to also there's your vertical speed right here and there's this, this rolling wheel to do that um, up or down 900 to 1000 is a good thing to shoot for the FLC is the flight level change and if you click on that it maintains the speed that was here in the speed strip and it'll simply adjust your rate of climb to maintain that and it will level off at 13. The vertical speed will also level off at 13 or whatever you have your alt cell selected. Again, don't hit the alt button or your level off at the um, elevation that you click that button on. Speed simply changes the knots to Mach and that's nearly useless in this aircraft, I think, but uh, it's there. So we'll be climbing up, adjust your power. Your power lever here will affect your torque here, and your prop lever will affect your prop RPMs here. 1900 in a low altitude or in the initial climb is fine. You're gonna wanna reduce that to 1750 to 1800 as you're climbing and through 6000 or plus. Just keep that in that box there. You'll notice though, when you pull back on your prop RPMs, your torque will suddenly increase. So keep an eye on your power lever when you're dropping back on your prop lever. They, they tend to interact with each other quite a bit, so that's something to keep a close eye on. When you're airborne and there's no risk of icing, you can go ahead and um, just deselect or let that go in the inertial separator. That can be off. You want to maybe at some point, if you need it, turn on your oxygen that's up here. Left click, turns it on. Left click, turns it off. Handy to know. At cruise, cruise will be about 180 knots, plus or minus. And then when you approach the landing field, you want to have your prop lever up to max, your condition lever still at high idle. You're going to approach with flaps up about 100 to 115 knots. And then when you're landing, you're going to land with full flaps somewhere around 75 to 85 knots. And then you're going to want to turn your yaw damper off as you approach. Landing and then you'll get your flaps up and the rest should be according to the things you know best. So thank you so much for your time and attention and involvement in my video and I'm grateful for it because I'll be looking at it again someday I'm sure for my own reminders. Have fun with it, enjoy your flying and thanks so much again. I'll enjoy it too. Take care. Bye-bye.